Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Nasher Sculpture Center and our interviewer, Linda Mao, speaks with exhibition curators, Tony Berlant and anthropologist, Dr. Thomas Wynn about the exhibition, First Sculpture, Hand Axe to Figure Stone. Now for Art This Week. Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and today I'm at the Nasher Sculpture Center speaking with the co-curators of First Sculpture, Hand Axe to Figure Stone. Tony Berlant is a visual artist who lives and works in Santa Monica, California, and Dr. Thomas Wynn is a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado. Thank you both for speaking with me today. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. So Tony, I'd like to start um, by asking you how this exhibition came to be. So beyond your personal interest in these objects, when did you start to think about it as an exhibition for an art museum, and who were the early collaborators? Uh, the, the thing that I was really good at in school, the only thing I realized at the time that I was good at, was great at, was show and tell. <laughs> and uh, show and tell is most exciting when you're showing people things they don't know anything about. And so that, that impulse to want to share and the, the tradition I come out of as an artist is you do exhibitions. And I've done a number of exhibitions about aspects of American Indian art. Mm -hmm. So it was just the most natural thing. And anybody who comes to my house has got to, whether they want to or not. Is uh, uh, subjected to yeah, an exhibition. I mean, my, my wife will talk to my daughter and say, uh, Daddy jumped on the sparklets water guy and <laughs> he gave him a full, full lecture. I said, no, no, he was really interested. So sharing that way, uh, everybody comes to my house. These these things, uh, Jeremy Strick came uh, to my house over the years to look at my work and he came, uh, invited one time to come look at the hand axes, figure stones, and he, uh, this is a long time ago, it, I think we started talking about actually doing an exhibition about eight years ago, mm -hmm. Jeremy suggested it, and then was very supportive, uh, uh, sending us all around the world to 22 different museums and uh, really allowing the exhibition to be realized on the level it is. And so Dr. Wynn got involved early on as a, an already established um, authority on hand axes, is that correct? Correct. Big mm -hmm. authority. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't mind to tell our viewers exactly what a hand axe is and what, um, what time period we're talking about when we're looking at these objects. A, a hand axe is a early stone tool that's made to be fairly large, and indeed about the size of the hand, as it turns out. Uh, it has a cutting edge all around, and it's shaped more or less like a teardrop. And the earliest ones are about 1.8 million years old, and then people continued to make them until about 200,000 years ago. So it's for one and a half million years our ancestors made hand axes. So they must have thought they were useful or at least interesting. And as, a, as an anthropologist, what is, what is the behavior of making these or the behaviors or the uses of them sort of tell you about, about the proto-humans that were making them? Well, it's something I've been interested in for a very long time, which is how we can look at stone tools and reconstruct something about the way these people thought. Uh, it's a field called cognitive archaeology. And one of the things you can do with a hand axe, and in fact some of the hand axes in this exhibition, is you can look at the sequence of steps that had to be made to make the hand axe. And from that you can learn some things about the way these people thought, at least when they were making tools. And you can see a change over time so that 1.8 million years ago, uh, the cognitive basis of these artifacts was a little bit simpler than it was 500,000 years later or 500,000 years after that. So it's one of the few ways we have for actually tracing the evolution of human thinking is by looking at the artifacts that people made. Now what they used the tools for, of course, was quite different. And mostly they were everyday, multi-purpose tools. That's what hand axes were for. And what Tony and I saw, looking in museums you know, from Europe and Africa and the Middle East, is most hand axes are actually pretty mundane, mediocre, sort of vaguely ugly artifacts. But they're perfectly functional. But a few were really beautiful. And we use the term overdetermined, meaning that people invested a lot more effort 
in producing these artifacts than was necessary for their function. Mm -hmm. And that's what tells us about their aesthetic intent, was this overdetermination. And when we say that some are ugly, <laughs> this, uh, this isn't a uh, cultural bias. Uh, the, the, this perfected form the brain really likes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's neurologically pleasing. It's not just uh, our uh, particular right. uh, cultural uh, moment. Mm -hmm. a demonstration of skill in the shape and the thinness and the beautiful materials. And it's, uh, uh, for me, art always was wonderful because it jumps so out of the cultural moment and you can look at it, something made hundreds and hundreds of years ago in a very different culture and still relate to it on a human level. Mm -hmm. And so it could not, and modern art particularly was involved with looking at tribal cultures and Th this could not be more the other, this is the ultimate other. And when you have this uh, response to it, th where you have a shared neurological bias, mm -hmm. uh, it's very exciting. Had much of your research, um, Tom, dealt with the aesthetic functions or the dual function of these things as aesthetic optics before Tony approached you with this project? No, actually. Um, I, I looked primarily at more boring things like uh, <laughs> the evolution of spatial cognition, right. um, the evolution of mechanical cognition. But starting probably about 30 years ago, colleagues of mine started to mention the term aesthetic occasionally mm -hmm. when they talked about hand axes, but they didn't really pursue it very much. So when Tony called, called me and, and we chatted, I realized that here was somebody who was very interested in just that thing, which is the aesthetic component of hand axes. And it was an opportunity for me to pursue that particular line of research. And so it was a wonderful experience for me because talking to Tony as we were looking at these artifacts was really one of the ways I developed my thinking about the evolution of aesthetic experience. So I think it's important to recognize that the, the premise of the exhibition is, is quite radical. I mean, you're basically advancing um, the timeline of our currently accepted art making as human behavior by something like 40,000 years, 50,000 years. Hundreds of half a million, million, half a million, or years. million years. Well, More, a million and a half. The, the standard story that is you still hear in art history classes is, is that art began 40,000 years ago with cave paintings. The painting. caves of Lascaux. And the weird thing about that is they don't talk about antecedents. Where did that come from? Um, they didn't just pop out of thin air. Mm -hmm. And so the argument we're making is that the roots of that aesthetic experience are very, very deep. They go back at least two million years. And that uh, by sort of cutting off the beginnings of aesthetic experience at 40,000 years ago, you've lost about the first 99% of the, uh, the evolution of that particular mm -hmm. kind of behavior. And you're looking at it with this exhibition as sort of that art making didn't develop as human behavior, humans developed as artistic beings because the art in this exhibition predates the human species. Yes, yes. And, and in fact, what, what we can see is that components of what we call artistic experience sort of develop over time in, a, in sort of additive fashion. Mm -hmm. So we first see evidence for just collecting objects with faces, and then we see evidence for imposing basic gestalt forms like spheres and symmetry, and then we see application of what the neuroesthetic people call uh, implicit visual effects like exaggeration um, and framing uh, that are applied to these artifacts. So we actually can see an evolutionary trend over time in our aesthetic abilities, but it's something that most people have not paid very much attention to. So for this exhibition, the two of you traveled to many museums around the world to, to look for the objects that you thought would amplify these, these visual qualities, is that correct? Correct. So what are a couple examples in the exhibition that you consider to be highlights that really well, I think we should talk about the, uh, the 3 point, uh, is it 6, 3.6 million years, the pebble? The, the pebble tool, sure. Um, so one object that Tony wasn't aware of, that I was, is the oldest object in the exhibition, which is a, a pebble from a site in South Africa called Makapanzagat. Uh, and it's not a tool in that it wasn't manufactured, it was a found object 
but we know that some creature, probably Australopithecus, two and a half million years ago, found this and carried it, in a sense, home because it's made out of a raw material that's not local. It doesn't occur in the site. Somebody carried it in, was probably an Australopithecus, but it has a beautiful face and it's a very evocative artifact. So that, in a sense, grounds the exhibition as being the earliest artifact and um, the first evidence of our ancestors being interested in the shapes and forms of objects. And it's more of an example of collecting an aesthetic object versus right. making an aesthetic object. But very, very soon after that, we get um, the first artifacts called hand axes, which are manufactured objects. And they did have bilateral symmetry, and the symmetry is what the stone nappers were trying to achieve when they made the artifact. It doesn't actually make the artifact any more effective to be symmetrical, um, but it was an added bonus. So if they made it symmetrical, they liked it better, um, they appreciated it, and that's really the beginning of aesthetic production. And also, in a lot of cases, is there evidence that these were used primarily as aesthetic objects or evidence that they were less likely to be used for the functional Most, use? most of them were probably used objects, but some of them weren't. In fact, many, probably I would guess, most of the hand axes in this exhibition were never used at all. Um, and archaeologists can often tell by looking at the edges microscopically whether the artifact was used. And many of the hand axes, were, especially the ones in this exhibition, were never used. And that, that suggests that they were making them for another reason, that it wasn't just they were making a meat cleaver, you know, they were making a really nice meat cleaver for some other reason, you know, um, and that's what we find so interesting. Tony, would you mind to tell me about the other types of objects in the show that we haven't talked about too much yet, which are the figure stones? Yeah, the figure great. stones are uh, the most controversial. Uh, very few uh, archaeologists uh, share our level of uh, um, confidence that they were made with intent. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, these are rocks that were selected because they look like things. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the exhibition, we only included pieces that were extensively worked that you could see that they were chipped, napped, mm -hmm. uh, all the way around to, to frame uh, an image. They're quite extraordinary. As a group, they look like a variety of people who I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have real expression, but they're just found, they were found by someone who had a incredibly startling moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all of us, when we find a rock that vaguely looks like a, a, right. a face or an animal, it can be very vague. Yes. And then when you turn it the other way, it doesn't or, mm -hmm. uh, have had that experience. And that's a natural neurological, not a cultural response, mm -hmm. but it's because we are who we are. That uh, it's natural to see Yeah, things. seeing things that look like things is part of what we're hardwired uh, to do. It's mm -hmm. not that, that everyone's capable of doing it. Everyone is uh, incapable of not doing it. You mentioned that it's controversial, and if I were a skeptic, I would say it's impossible to extricate our present-day cultural biases and our, as you say, our own hardwiring um, in the identification of a figure stone. So how did you go about choosing the objects for this exhibition that sort of um, to answer these doubts. My cat has to see it. <laughs> <laughs> the is the, the cat the, is the, the ultimate the curator. Well, this idea about bias, <laughs> and uh, I noticed early on that if I put out even a simple Victorian doorstop cat uh, in the backyard, uh, that my cat would just freeze and then creep up slowly and then <laughs> sniff it. And once they sniffed it, it knew it was nothing. So that's one of the basic questions of, if we see something that looks like something, we think that they neurologically mm -hmm. uh, were programmed to make the same kind of interpretations. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we feel very confident around that. But, uh, and I think many objects that don't show uh, signs of having been worked were also in that category, but for the exhibition and to reinforce our point of view, we only pick things that were heavily, obviously, worked. That there's evidence that they've been worked with. They were modified, to yes. Be modified. But not the, but not the, not the most important aspect. Just through framing. So the features are naturally occurring. For instance, on a face right. where the eye holes or indentations would have been present in a rock. Correct. But they cut away. 
yes. the extra rock to make a head shape, exactly. for instance. And you, one can only imagine, truly, uh, how great an importance this had for them and the power that they invested in these things. But I think that was, it was huge. So because these objects are so old that we don't have too much evidence in the way they might have been used. Is that correct? Correct. So we just can only... Well, not the hand axes, but, but the figure stones. The figure Absolutely. stones. Absolutely. We don't know. So I wanted to um, mention also the exhibition catalog. You have a long list of multidisciplinary heavy hitters for the exhibition catalog. Jared Diamond, um, Dr. Ramachandran, um, Richard Deacon. How did you guys go about choosing and who to ask for, the, for these essays? Well, but partly for the, for the sort of science archaeological side, these were people I knew or had knew by reputation as being authorities in, in the field. Uh, I actually had met John Gallick before and I'd met Namagoran Inbar before. The world of early Stone Age archaeology is, is fairly small, and so we run into one another w once in a while. Um, so that, that was not difficult for me because, you know, they would recognize who I was and, and they would respond. Mm -hmm. And they were enthusiastic. I was actually a little bit surprised because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of controversial. And so I sort of hesitated as, you know, oh, what is, what is Damagor and Inbar going to say? But, mm -hmm. but she was uh, enthusiastic in, in her support. And not that she agrees with everything that I say because she doesn't, mm -hmm. but, uh, but she thought it was a, a wonderful idea of, of a project to do. The only sort of out of the blue one we did was uh, Professor Ramachandran, mm -hmm. um, who is one of the founders of uh, neuroaesthetics, the, the, the study of the neurology of art. And I knew his work because I'd, I'd read a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so I just uh, took a chance and sent him an email and, and said, I'm going to send you a package. And then I sent him a package which, with some things. And then I didn't hear for you know, a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then apparently he opened it and got very excited and got back in touch with me. And we had him come up to Santa Monica and I flew out and we had a, a, a very enjoyable uh, interaction with him. And he was enthusiastic in his support. And, and this is, a, we want to, I think we should say that this is an opening. Mm -hmm. This is not the last chapter. Mm -hmm. about this and particularly but it's the first time that they've been shown as art objects in an art museum mm -hmm. and uh, we're very interested in the reinforcing responses but also the really convincing critiques of our thinking mm -hmm. uh, we claim we will claim partial credit for because they're in response uh, to our initial the response. Absolutely. And to follow uh, up on, on that, we, we have a way that we've looked at them, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the only way to look at them or necessarily even the correct way to look at them. It's, I think, been very effective for organizing the exhibition, and I think we make a very strong case. But in a sense, we're out there on the end of the limb, and uh, you know, we're, it's easy to take pot shots, and we are actually ready. For, well, I think we're ready for them. We encourage <laughs> them, um, and because I think if it gets the dialogue going, Absolutely. I think uh, we'll learn a lot more about what's happened in the past. And that is generally the case in academia when you do something that's de definitely different, and it's a building block for your colleagues, for sure. Well, Tom is extraordinarily open. In his books, at the end of chapters, he has. A a, a short thing of how I could be wrong. That's yeah. how you title it, and you give the other points of view. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's part of why it's been so terrific working with you, and all of the authorities we've we've worked mm -hmm. with, and they're huge personalities in each uh, uh, discipline. Uh, we've been amazingly open. Uh, to everything. Mm -hmm. Well, given the multidisciplinary nature of this project and like you've mentioned, all the amazing people that you've gotten to work with, um, I ask each of you this individually, have you taken anything away from it into your, into your separate fields, into your future projects? Tony, do you want to take that first? Well, I think Tom is more directly involved. Mm -hmm. Right. It has an ongoing involvement. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, uh, I, I, decided a long time ago that I had to accept that this might not be good for me uh, as an artist. I think it is. Uh, uh, but part of being an artist is you just respond 
right. an impulse to whatever you're attracted to. Do. And so perhaps it, the, it doesn't, the sustained uh, the viewing experience. Has been... And I would I would hope that people who come to see the exhibition would have the same feeling that they are lineal descendants mm -hmm. uh, from these people, and uh, not worry about uh, understanding, but just be experiential mm -hmm. and accept that. And then if, if they get excited, then they can start reading all the theorizing. And, and from my perspective, I think it's, it's broadened the way I look at the artifacts. I mean, I was, I was trained to be a very skeptical, a very analytical archeologist. And it, in a way, it's the only way academically to succeed because it's the only way you can hold your ground. But, but Tony's taught me that you would need to look at things a little more broadly and that you can't simply be a skeptic all of the time because you, you miss a lot mm -hmm. when you do that. And I, th I think that's been a, a, an important contribution to my thinking. Uh, I'm not nearly as, uh, to use the old term, uptight as I used <laughs> to be. No, we, we were having lunch, uh, breakfast here in Dallas some time ago. And, and I said, uh, you know, I've come to believe that the reason that we have certain different interpretations is that I think more like a man or called than you did. And you said, actually, I was just thinking that. <laughs> and I think it's uh, true that artists are more open to subjective uh, interpretation and experience and also morphing interpretations, that, that something that has a multiple uh, level of interpretation is more alive and more interesting than if it changes from experience to experience. Well, thank you both so much for speaking with thank me today. You. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you, Linda. It's been fun. We want to thank Tony and Dr. Wynn for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to nashersculpturecenter.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar